and welcome to All Things Technical. This is a follow-up video to the last video that I've made about the Triumph TR6. And as some of you mentioned in the comments of that video, I've painted quite a rosy picture of the TR6, or classic cars in general. But yes, it is true, there is more. It's not all sunshine and plain sailing, especially not with a British classic car from the 1970s. So let's go ahead and pull this car back down onto the not-so-rosy ground of reality and discuss a few technical issues and oddities. The TR6 might not be the most sophisticated car out there, but maybe, and partially because of that, it is a lot of fun to drive when it's working. And there are a few reasons why it might not be working. And there is one Achilles heel type situation we will cover in a bit. But just to clarify things so that there's no confusion later, this is a Triumph TR6 PI from 1971. It's the petrol injected version of the TR6 that was available in Europe. North America only got the carbureted version. The fuel injection gives you a bit more power and more torque, but also a few more technical difficulties. Let's start at the back end of the car and work our way forwards. If you open the boot, you'll see that the boot space isn't bad at all. And there's actually even more space. If you lift up the wooden board, there are tons of tools and spare parts hidden under it in order to be able to deal with some of the technical problems that might occur. But that is not what I wanted to show you here. There's the tank right at the end of the trunk. In this car, it's a new aluminium tank because the old one was leaking slightly, which caused the whole trunk to smell of old petrol which it still does, so you can't really put anything in it that you don't want to smell like that. And trust me, you don't want anything to smell like old petrol, that is not a good smell. So either you put the things into some heavy duty Ziploc bags and put them in the trunk, or you put the things onto the luggage rack on top of the trunk. But that is still not what I wanted to show you here. That is because originally the Lucas fuel pump was installed in here on the left side, and that caused a few problems. In order to understand why, we'll have to have a quick look at the way the Lucas fuel injection system is working. I'll not go into too much detail here because there is enough to say about it to fill its own video, but here are the basics. Fuel gets pumped out of the tank via the fuel pump into the fuel line leading to the fuel distributor at the front of the car next to the engine. That line is pressurised to around 7 bar by the fuel pump. Now, high pressure fuel enters the fuel distributor where rotating parts and moving plungers do their magic to push a certain amount of fuel into these six fuel lines in the right order. Some of the fuel is leaking past the moving bits and pieces and is used to lubricate the whole system. And then it flows all the way back into the tank. These six fuel lines, however, go to the injectors which sit here in the air intake ports. They are spring operated and open once a certain pressure is exceeded, releasing the petrol to go into the engine which drops the pressure in the line and they close again. The important thing to remember here is that they need a certain fuel pressure to open. With that in mind, let's go back to the fuel pump that used to sit in the boot. The original Lucas pump was not really designed to deliver fuel at such a high pressure, so it was running hot even in normal operation. And due to the fact that it sat in the boot with no real airflow to cool it, they often went into thermal meltdown and broke fairly regularly. Even if they didn't break, they were still able to cause some problems, especially on hot days. In that regard, it's a good thing the TR6 PI was never sold in the USA, because in the Californian sunshine, this would have been an even bigger problem. So what's happening is, the fuel enters the fuel pump, and because it's running so hot, it also heats up the fuel. So preheated fuel is getting delivered to the fuel distributor, where most of it is injected into the engine, and the rest is flowing back into the tank, but not before being warmed up even more by the heat of the engine. So warm fuel is being pushed back into the tank and enters the fuel pump again at some point, being heated up even more. And so the cycle continues and continues and continues. And the less fuel there is in the tank, the quicker it heats up. And at some point the fuel gets so hot that it starts to form gas bubbles in the high pressure line. And that is a big problem. Because petrol in its liquid state is incompressible, it's fairly easy to reach the 7 bar pressure. But as soon as there's a gas bubble, the force of the fuel pump squeezes that gas bubble instead of maintaining the pressure in the fuel line, and the pressure drops. And as mentioned earlier, the fuel injectors need a certain pressure to open. And now that pressure isn't reached anymore, and temporarily there is no fuel injected into the engine, 
leading to a very uneven running engine and a great power loss. The advice back in the day was to always fill up the fuel tank all the way on hot days and park in the shade in order to try to slow down the heating up of the fuel. They also used to say that what got you home on a hot day was a bag of frozen peas placed on the old Lucas fuel pump in order to avoid thermal meltdown. But there is a more reliable, convenient and longer lasting solution and that is to move the fuel pump into the wheel well where there is some airflow to help cool it down and while you're at it you can also change the fuel pump to a slightly more modern Bosch one which has been actually designed to produce pressures this high and therefore doesn't run as hot in general. So this takes at least one heat source out of the fuel system. This is a modification that you'll probably find on most TR6 PIs still out on the road today because it improves the reliability tremendously. But that does not mean that you won't have any problems with the fuel system anymore. The fuel distribution unit has to be in a very good shape to work properly and it is quite a delicate system. Once you get a bit of dirt in it that will create scratches on parts with very close tolerances and mess the whole thing up. So it's always a good idea to install a good fuel filter somewhere. And once the fuel has made it past the distribution unit, we're still not safe yet. It still has to go through the fully mechanical fuel injectors. And if the spring pressure in them isn't what it's supposed to be, the injectors open too early or not at all. And yes, even if the fuel is injected at the right time into the inlet, things can still go wrong. If a fuel injector is clogged up a bit or a little faulty, the spray pattern might not be uniform. It can create little droplets that don't mix with the air that well and you don't get a proper combustion. And then unburned fuel is ignited in the hot exhaust and the thing backfires so hard you think there is a rear-mounted cannon under the car. But if all of that works, it is beautiful. Once you've got the car started, which can take some time after it's sat for a while, that is because the fuel from the fuel lines that go to the injectors evaporates over time and they first need to fill up with high pressure fuel again until the engine splatters into life again producing vast clouds of blue smoke for a bit. And that is what you saw at the beginning of the video. You can clearly tell when the first fuel injectors started injecting some fuel. <laughs> And now it's time to talk about a little red plastic piece that can spoil the whole fun right at the start. This plastic piece sits in the fuel distributor, transmitting the rotation essentially from the camshaft to the fuel distributor and therefore powering it. And right during engine start, this likes to break in certain situations. Now that's an easy fix you might think, just replace it with one made out of a stronger plastic, but that will lead to disastrous results because it will just break the next weakest thing and that seems to be a gear on the ignition timing system. Ask me how we know. The problem lays in the fuel distribution system. It likes to seize up under certain situations and so far we were not able to figure out what those situations really are. We suspect a thermal problem, something cooling down faster than something else and fuel in there might vaporize and then there's no lubrication anymore. That's why we installed an additional cooling system for the fuel distribution unit powered by an extra fan at the front when the engine is being switched off in hot situations. But unfortunately that didn't improve the situation reliably and even the only advice the whole combined knowledge of the internet could give is carry a bag of spare little red plastic pieces. And considering that changing this takes around an hour with some practice and one of these costs around 40 euros these days, that's just not fun. So starting this car on a hot day is a bit like playing Russian roulette. The little red plastic piece might break at any point. Arguably the results are less severe than when playing real Russian roulette, but it is still very annoying. And lately the fuel distributor even seized up while driving, which came as a bit of a very unpleasant surprise and delayed the making of this video even further. But again, when everything is working, it is great fun. So let's try and hit the road again. Wish us luck. <laughs> Yes, the car started again, even though it was very hot that day. 
these were just a few, in this case, engine related technical issues, mostly specific to the petrol injected version of the TSX. And these were, of course, not the only problems TSXs can encounter. These cars are around 50 years old by now, so you'll have to expect to put some work in to keep them running. That is just something to keep in mind when owning a classic car. Although some problems are a bit more annoying than others. On the way back home, it stopped firing on all six cylinders for no apparent reason. Fun times. But for now, let's just enjoy it while it was still working properly. Thank you so much for watching, sorry that parts of this video were a little bit out of focus at times, I used a different camera and there are still a few things to get used to. But yes, we've passed the 500 subscribers lately, which I think is pretty cool, so thank you again to everybody who has subscribed, and see you in the next video.